glad the sun has just come out. Can you all hear me without the mic? Yes. Good. Excellent. We are defined by places real and imagined. And the poets in this section have crossed many boundaries, national, spiritual, and emotional. And we have brought for you poems from all over the world, from our own vibrations, our own journeys. And these poems and poets reflect so much terrain, both real and imagined. And what I'd like to do is um, share with you a little bit of, of background about um, our poets as we start. So we are joined uh, by Bill Yarrow, who is here joining us from Chicago. He is a professor of English at Joliet Junior College, and he teaches creative writing, Shakespeare, and film. He's the author of several poetry books. And with him is Ray Farmer, who is the director of the Office of Performing Arts at the Colleges of the Fenway. He's an award-winning composer, conductor, writer, and arts administrator. And together, they have prepared a combination of music and poetry that is really wonderful. And when I first heard the compositions and the poems last summer, I thought, I really want to bring this to Salem, to the National Poetry Festival. So our first combination of, of poetry and music and looking at uh, poems in place. So we're going to start with Bill Yero, who will read some of his poems, and then he will be joined uh, by Ray Farmer, who will play some of his compositions to the poems. So that's the order. We have other poets who I will introduce um, in a sequence after Bill and Ray. Thank you very much. Let's go welcome Bill and Ray. Uh, thank you, Becker. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, happy to be at the Massachusetts Poetry Festival with all of you. Um, I'm going to read a few poems of a uh, place. Um, with all the news recently, uh, cities are on my mind, so I thought I'd start with this poem called City Rises in Me. Cities, cities, I have lived in cities, habitual, arrogant. Cities circumscribed by cities, on the, the alert for alacrity, filled with false vitality, rising the lies out of history. Virgin cities, bloated with stoic pride, notorious for hope, filled with ethical travail. These cities, yes, but also cities reticent, inferential, embedded with dissuasive. A decade here, a decade there. To what end? Position. We need locusts, not looseness in our life. What's a road? A swift excuse for a city at each end. What is not a city? Nothing. Socrates lived in a city. So did my Lansky. The city rose against them. That's what cities do. They rise, sometimes in us, sometimes against us. The city rises in me. I hear its whisper. I ignore its roar. I had the uh, great uh, good fortune to be in India a few years ago. So, um, a couple of poems uh, from uh, my visit to India. The first one is called The Poorestest of Borders. Uh, the title uh, comes from a uh, line uh, from uh, David Foster Moss. It was in India where we learned to navigate pity. We expected neither tragedy nor enlightenment, though flashlight and corpses were paraded down the street, and elephants touched us on the head. We saw goats graze the shade of the butterball, watched serious tourists kick at the rarefied dust, heard gossip desecrate the mission of the Matra Mandir. A single ox on the highway, oblivious of speeding trucks, was the emblem of time at war with eternity. Unbidden, the harmony of the impossible came to pass. Meanwhile, on the beach in Chennai, this morning, tourists riding large birds, mauled horses lashed to stinging waves, gangs of boys with otters stabbing the driftwood, the Gandhi statue suffused inconsolably with sun. Chennai is a city in uh, southern uh, uh, India, and um, it, it was formerly Madras. 
Um, this next poem is called Odds of Road. Odds of Road is a little bit north of uh, Delhi, and that's where the Taj Mahal is. Do you seek in the heart-shaped palace the cold telos of love the guy asked us? Everyone nodded yes. I stared at the bus window into the face of a ripe monkey whose owner demanded 40 rupees for any photographs I took. Is there nothing willing to forgive the terror of its cost? Beyond the jade gate, a lotus pillar nods to a braided fort. To enter this colony, you must take off your shoes, and when you do, it is 1653, the year of the diamond moon. Mongols rule the candy land. Alligators bask on the soft edge of the Amuna, but in the iron sky, the ivory birds are still the birds. So I also uh, had a chance to be in the Middle East. Uh, I lived in Israel for a time, and, uh, and recently I visited Jordan. So uh, here are two uh, poems about those experiences. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, about an uh, experience that I had in uh, the town of Ashwin, New Jordan, which is uh, northern Jordan, and uh, there's a famous castle in which we were supported. So this is called Ashwin Castle. You, my little cat, are brisk and fluid. I, like an owl, am stiff and steady. You clambered up the rocks and held out your arms. The wind in a swoosh came up behind you. Incredulous, I watched you fall. You did not see me looking as you stood placid and passive, looking out over the carbon hills. But then the wind, then the wind, mistook your arms for wings, and helpless, I watched you fall. Horrified, I watched you fall through the future into the past, past your family, past your accolades, past your handsome penchant for reconciliation into the universal solvent of your confidence. I saw you dash upon those stones. I saw you bounce into the sea. I saw you sink into inky velvet. My tragedy is that my imagination pictures all the facets of disaster. But you see only soaring, and that is your invisible gift. I had never been to the pastel city before, but there I was, 
walking down the prospect, descending the Gustave doorway underground, stopping on the bridges to snap pictures, eating Azerbaijan beef, attending a ballet, a circus, watching the pit prostitutes in stiletto heels, encountering artists on walls and authors on signs, talking to you over pasta and wine, over and over, to see soberly whom you had become. Then I hear that dream, your dead parents coming to me, greeting me, embracing me, pleased, laughing, their faces alive with smiles, and I felt somehow enfolded, ennobled, and emboldened with happiness. And when I waked, I cried to dream again. Egregious black squirrels inhabit the permission 
and fracture the crystalline trees. Without conscience, disorder black squirrels inhabit Upper Michigan and scratch the ingenuous sky.
things about Bill's poetry and about Bill as a person is he loves puns. Uh, the next piece uh, requires a little bit of background. It's called Ocean City. Um, but Ocean is spelled O-S-S-I-A-N. Uh, when I read it, I thought, didn't I study something in grad school about Ocean? Uh, well, it turns out that he influenced Mendelssohn. Uh, Ocean was a, a medieval bard. Uh, and Mendelssohn, one of the characters is Fingal, and you may have heard of Fingal's cave origin. Well, not so fast. Mendelssohn, uh, Ocean, is a fictitious medieval bard. Uh, he was made up out of pretty much whole cloth by John McPherson in 1760, who decided that it was easier to pass off medieval bard poetry than it was to pass off his own poetry. Uh, this this hoax, Samuel Johnson immediately spotted the hoax, but it took basically 150 years to convince the world at large that it was a hoax. Uh, so I was researching this, and it's like 1760s. I wonder what kind of music was going on in Scotland in 1760s, bagpipes. Uh, and I thought, bagpipes. So I wrote something for these small pipes, not the traditional Highland pipes, but these small pipes which of course I knew absolutely nothing about. But there is the whip, so I learned. And I ran past the piper and she said, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> so here's Ocean City. I can still hear the shriek of the laughing wind, the crash of a broken glass. The waves against the jetty at noon. I can still see the boardwalk empty with cyclists at midnight. At noon, the claw of the seagulls. At midnight, I'm crowded with the ghosts of sleeping old people. I can still hear the roar of rusted tackle on the marlin boat. The drip of cherry syrup onto a cone of crushed ice. The scream of teens dizzy for foam and ice. I can still smell the beer of the hard stuff, fresh to bar ash in the sea, the milk of the freezer the dirty pool hall, the vinegar stink of peanut oil fries. I can still hear the sinister click of zippo layers, the Chesterfield voices of the Pocorino layers. The oily pattern of pot based chips. I can still taste the flour and chowder served by hairnet matrices to foul mouth barbers of city lunch. While in the alley, black men carved ice in the back of the tops. But most, on sun starved nights, I smell the only German shepherds. Locked in cages under the pit, and the unworldly perfume of the ponytail girl who played alone with Doris. So this is called She Waited for 